Good evening and welcome to Associated Black Charities Equity at Work webinar series. We are so excited to have you join us this evening. 
My name is Chrissy Thornton and I'm the president and CEO of ABC. And all year long, we have brought to you this exciting webinar series all about empowering people of color to navigate structural racism in the workplace, but also to inspire our allies and corporations to be more inclusive. And so tonight is no different as we will talk about fighting diversity fatigue. In corporate landscapes, the journey toward true diversity and inclusion often requires a sustained effort. And for Black professionals and other advocates, this can mean fighting an uphill battle to keep initiatives alive, even when fatigue starts to set in. As the initial enthusiasm for the work begins to wane, people may find themselves at the forefront working tirelessly to ensure that equity remains a central focus in the workplace. And that comes with an emotional toll. Constantly having to push for diversity cannot be overstated in how it begins to wear you down, perhaps, and affect your mental health and your overall well uh, well-being. And so those of us who feel a profound sense of responsibility and commitment to the work often weigh the benefits of shouldering this crucial work and then also having to confront the consistent barriers and the skepticism and the fatigue of colleagues who may question why the continued emphasis remains on diversity and diversity work. And so tonight we will talk about fighting through and fighting diversity fatigue and pushing this work forward. And I am so excited to have an esteemed panel of speakers with us this evening that I have the benefit of knowing and working with very closely. And at this time, I'll ask our guest panelists to join me on the webinar. Good evening, everyone. I am hopeful that you recognize some of the faces on tonight's panel. And we will do some brief introductions, starting with Chevelle Montgomery. Hi, thank you for joining us this evening, everyone. My name is Chevelle Montgomery. I am the Director of Development here at Associated Black Charities. Wonderful. Bernard? Good evening, everyone. My name is Bernard Sims. I am the Director of Culture and Community here at Associated Black Charities. And John. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Law. I am the Manager of Programs and Workforce Strat Sorry, Manager Programs and Workforce Strategy at Associated Black Charities. Yeah, so ta-da, you have <laughs> a, a good portion of the team at ABC, Associated Black Charities. And when we decided tonight to talk about what it means to fight diversity fatigue, to do this work, to do it tirelessly, to stand up against some of the obstacles and barriers that are presented against this work being successful. I thought who better to join me on tonight's Equity at Work panel than my esteemed colleagues from ABC. As you know, Associated Black Charities is a racial equity organization. We work tirelessly, not some of the time, but all of the time to make sure that we are mitigating and breaking down the barriers and obstacles that are created in uh, by structural racism. And many of these barriers, of course, are created in the criminal justice system, in housing, in health equity and access, in education, but also, as we know, in the workplace. And all year long, we've been talking about how workplace discrimination shows up, the racial wealth gap and other ways that black professionals and other professionals of color are marginalized in workplaces and how to navigate that and how to begin to eliminate that. And so tonight I'm so happy to have all of you join us as we talk about fighting diversity fatigue. So as we consider diversity fatigue from our lens, which is we are advocates, we're doing this work tirelessly. Tell me a little bit about why you think this conversation is an important one to have. I'll go first. Um, I think this conversation is important because, again, this is what our work lends itself to. And as Black people, we really don't have the luxury to not push this work forward or to not constantly talk about diversity um, strategy. So even with us, I know like sometimes our colleagues or allies could be a little bit fatigued too, but it's also fatiguing for us to also have to push for these type of rights that we kind of see being pushed on to other people and that they don't have to fight so hard. They're just a lot of these. these um, abilities and things like that. Sure, absolutely. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the important aspects of understanding uh, like the diversity fatigue uh, is that part of it is understanding like the fatigue is a symptom of running in place where people are often, you know, a lot of DEI work in businesses or organizations are about making like a big splash, but it's not actually about like swimming forward or actually changing the sea. 
Uh, and I think like, as we, you know, kind of like the, when you're like drowning, you're not supposed to be splashing around. You're supposed to be actually moving your way towards the shore. And I think um, when we are pushed to only be making splashes, but not actually moving, uh, it's it makes sense that uh, DEI workers and advocates are getting fatigued and eventually burning out. Absolutely. Any thoughts, Bernard? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just so much um, that goes into this. And I guess when you talk about it in the simplest form, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you would have, uh, I would say, emotional resistance to the work that we do. Um, also, it, it, it lends a lot of, um, I would say, uh, it, it takes a lot to really get people to understand the frustration that goes over time with trying to do this work, to achieve this work, to meet your goals, to meet your benchmarks, but for really, really getting people to understand exactly what it is that we're trying to do um, that will have a lasting, I would say, impression on most folks or really have a lasting change. It's really about the impact of the DEI work that we do. Um, and so that fatigue can set in um, because everybody may not be on the same page. And I'll be honest with you, Chrissy, sometimes you hear people say in this work, you know, does everything have to be about DEI? Mm. You know, so I think that also, you know, leads us into other conversations. Absolutely. And many of us have been involved with this work for some time, for, for uh, decades, along, you know, being committed to this advocacy and these, these these types of efforts. But what I will say is we all know in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd, there was a uprising of equity work. There was uprising of DEI. We started using new terminology. It became the buzz topic and the hot topic for corporations who knew they needed to do something to step into the light of diversity and inclusion. And so we started to see a lot of, I think, increased effort around equity work and increased attention around equity work. And now we're in 2023. And what I will say that we all agree on is that a lot of this work is starting to be rolled back. There uh, was not a sustained investment in this work by a lot of companies that said they were committed to it. A lot of them at, at, in the early stages hired DEI officers, diversity professionals, and they dedicated time and investment to the work. And we're seeing that start to slowly roll back because either they don't see it as a forefront issue any longer, or they feel like they've checked the boxes and made the progress and done what they've needed to do, or they don't have the resources to sustain to sustain the work. And so now some of that initial enthusiasm over this equity work, specifically for ABC racial equity work, has started to fade a little bit, requiring what we would classify as even more momentum and even more commitment from allies to double down and do this work. When I say that what you all do every day, like unceasingly, unapologetically, now needs even more momentum, more effort, more sustained you know, uh, work, how does that even make you feel? Because I feel fatigued just saying it. <laughs> how, how do you all react to that? Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, Chrissy, to the point that you made. Um, a lot of organizations and companies um, after the murder of George Floyd made a lot of promises that they didn't keep. Uh, and a lot of organizations were actually banking on um, a lot of these companies and organizations and individuals coming to the forefront, really rolling up their sleeves, ready to make a change, ready to make a difference. But what we've seen um, is a reversal of that. And so it's almost like going back to you know, before George Floyd was murdered, you know, now we're having, you know, more of an uphill battle again to convince convince folks that DEI is important, um, which also brings on a heavy um, onset of fatigue. Um, there's a lot of skepticism um, hovering around DEI. Um, everybody became a DEI professional mm -hmm. after the murder of George Floyd or a so-called professional um, you know, just which caused, I think, a lot of misinformation to be put out there, exactly what DEI was all about. So I think, um, you know, for most, they have to figure out how can they make a positive change through the lens of this DEI work. Okay. And when you look at um, a, a, an, an historical perspective of this DEI work, um, 
can we really see how far the needle has actually moved? Um, because DEI didn't just start after the murder of George Floyd. It's actually been going on for decades, but it probably had uh, came on a different name or a different banner. Um, so the, the, work, the work of equity and inclusion and diversity has always been you know, at the forefront, especially for African-Americans um, to achieve this work, but now it's taking on a more uh, lucrative and financial form as well. Mm. Okay. So what are our thoughts around leadership commitment or lack thereof and how that has affected whether or not the efforts that have been put in place have been successful in organizations? I know that we understand that leadership commitment at the highest levels of organizations is not just crucial, it's essential for success of these efforts. Um, when the leaders in place are championing, championing diversity and inclusion, it sets the tone for the entire organization. What do we feel about leaders and how they've shown up for this work over the past couple of years? Any thoughts about that? I would say post George Floyd, it did feel like all of the leaders did kind of rally around the DEI efforts and strategies. But now realizing that some of those strategies are beginning to tap taper off, it makes you realize that, oh, that was just a hot topic for the moment. Like, were these leaders really invested into this DEI work? Or was that just something flashy to say so they can get on the TV and talk about it so they can hire these employees? Even some of the DEI people that have been hired, those job titles are beginning to phase out as well. It's not a priority. So it is really disheartening that, you know, like this DEI work is kind of a buzz and it's flashy when the tragedy happens. But as that kind of tapers off, these leaders are no longer invested into those strategies. All right. Absolutely. John? Yeah, I wanted to kind of like uh, pull out one of the words should I'll just use strategy. I think kind of what people have seen uh, demonstrates that there wasn't really like a DEI strategy, right? Yeah. That there was, we hired someone, but we don't know what they're really trying to accomplish. We hired someone, but we're not giving them the resources to do what we're telling them that they should be accomplishing. Um, you know, I think it's oftentimes hir hiring the consultant whether it's a consultant or a DI off officer or so on, like yeah. it's actually leadership kind of wipe, washing their hands of like the responsibility. Um, and, you know, when asked about like, what are they doing for DEI? It's oftentimes about like, oh, we're doing like this bias training. We're doing like uh, things that are really tools that go toward building strategy, but like <clears throat> to reuse the metaphor I use at the Equity in Action Conference, like bias training, ERGs, all these things are tools to help build the house, but it's not the actual blueprint for the house. And mm -hmm. leadership needs to be invested in creating an actual blueprint for advancing <clears throat> DEI strategy within an organization for those tools to have meaningful impact. Absolutely, I agree with that. So let's talk about some of these tools, <clears throat> and some of these uh, initiatives I think that would, would have been and should have been implemented in DEI efforts since 2020 and since some of the uh, emphasis has been put on equity and inclusion. Um, we're, we, John mentioned anti-bias training. We've heard a lot of that. Um, we've heard about diverse hiring practices. So there's been scrutiny around hiring and making sure that the practices are attracting diverse uh, talent uh, pools and having blind recruitment processes. Also ERGs, which, you know, um, we'll talk about that in 2024 a little bit. I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of ERGs, but certainly that's been a, a tactic and a tool used in diversity work in corporation. What are some other ones that you guys are aware of and, and uh, want to push forward? Hmm. Um, I would say the implementation of diversity and inclusion specialists, as John mentioned, having those people who have job titles specifically um, for diversity and inclusion efforts um, in different education and training programs, as you mentioned, um, some of those strategies and trainings um, have also been implemented and have been well. But again, as John mentioned, those are just tools and not necessarily the blueprint to creating the strategies around DEI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading... Um about two weeks ago, something about DEI. And actually it was saying that DEI is actually a uh, behavior change. Um, and especially for organizations, you know, they even have to think about rebranding when they say that they are a DEI organization. Um, you have to realize exactly what that means. So when you say that you are a DEI organization, you know, it's, it's going to be a part of your discipline, which as Chevelle said, you're going to have regular training. You're going to be planning 
um, a lot of your work to make sure that DEI is embedded, um, that even, even through your evaluation processes um, and being recognized, you want to be recognized for the DEI work that you are accomplishing. So, you know, as you're bringing on uh, new folks and new hires into your organization, that should be embedded. That's, that should be something that folks should see right from the onset that you are definitely a DEI organization because the work will speak for itself. So I think, you know, going back to what you said about leadership, it starts with the head. The leadership has to be out front, you know, promoting, being the champion for DEI. And I think that will have a trickle down effect. But if it's being instituted at the job through trainings um, and things like that, you'll definitely be able to reap the, the rewards and benefits of the DEI work. I'd like to steal from John. I do this often when he puts forth his <laughs> analogies. And I love this building the house as, as a, a metaphor for actually developing strategy. How important do we feel shared language is? Hmm. Vernacular, like shared understanding of terminology, because I think that's where a lot of the strategy goes wrong, right? Like where we start talking about DEI and what does that reflect and how is equity different than equality and how is racial equity different than DEI? And, um, you know, how important is it when you are setting strategy for your equity efforts in an organization to establish shared terminology? And how do we think that may be impacting some of the work we're seeing? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's vital to the work, right? Because mm -hmm. um, you know, something I say a lot is like, how you define the problem defines the solution. Mm -hmm. So like, if we are using the same words, we mean different things. If we are seeing the problem, uh, in different ways, we're going to be looking for different solutions. We're not going to get on the same page. Uh, we're not going to get um, to the same strategy. It's kind of like, if we to continue the metaphor, if we all say like, we're going to build a house, but I'm thinking like a lean to, and you're thinking a mansion, like yeah. we're going to be <laughs> gathering the wrong, the different, uh, we're going to be hiring different people. We're going to be buying different materials um, and getting on the same page with definitions and knowing like, and I think part of that is like, I think people sometimes get stuck on like finding the perfect definition. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's like, you need to find a definition that works for your organization. You don't need a definition that, you don't even need a definition that stays the same. It might be like in two years, you reevaluate and kind of redefine how, how you see the problem. But it, getting on the same page initially helps you define where you're going. So I have a challenging question that I'd love to hear from all of you on, because one of the uh, ways that companies and organizations have implemented DEI efforts has been a focus on what people refer to as cultural competence. Mm. I tend not to use that word because I don't believe in cultural competence. I don't believe in a lot of things you guys have learned over this past year. I don't believe in cultural competence. I believe more in cultural engagement. And this is where it's a shift in terminology, right? Like I don't believe that you can become competent culturally in, in uh, you know, in a, a culture where you don't have membership, right? Or in an identity where you don't have membership. But I do believe you can begin to engage effectively. How do we, what do we feel about cultural competence and can this work be done without the marginalized groups? Hmm. That is a tough question. <laughs> uh, I, I can go again. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I definitely agree uh, that cultural competence um, has, I think, I think what uh, the problem with cultural competence is like, it becomes like a status, like I've achieved cultural competency. Uh, and that I and that means like I am now competent from now and forever. Uh as opposed as opposed to like it's a learning process. And we're always learning more about different cultures, we're always learning about different demographics. Uh, and that we're never going to be perfectly, uh, you know, even like for example, like um, uh, like you're never gonna become like culturally competent with working class black Baltimoreans because there's so many different B Baltimore uh Baltimoreans and like it's it's kind of like a trap to imagine like you can uh achieve a competency um I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> well, I, I want I want to know your view on whether or not this work can be done in isolation of the marginalized people. Can you achieve racial equity in an organization without leaning on Black people? Can you do it without leaning on, you know, whatever the marginalized group we're talking about for the moment? Can you do it without those people? Is it possible? Yeah, I definitely 
don't think it's possible because uh I think there's I think there's a little bit of a, like a chicken and egg situation here where you uh lack uh inequity within an organization creates a lack of diversity but also a lack of diversity creates inequity within the organization so I do think like even as if for example leaders decision makers etc are bringing in uh experts and consultants to help them guide their decision making they as they're if they're making meaningful differences in the in the decisions they're making and the policies that they're implementing and the practices that they're advancing they should naturally that leadership group the decision makers should be becoming more diverse otherwise like if it's not if it's still the same people you you really have to question like are the changes you're making actually effective because it's not creating that groundswell change uh in coming up into leadership mm -hmm. i agree with that and so and i know chevelle you look worried like you're like don't ask me any difficult questions <laughs> but i'm coming to ask you a question um uh, because i think that's important for us to lend our view on on these things including i know you and i recently sat in a forum where we heard from a diversity leader who was competent and and knowledgeable but who was not a member of any marginalized group mm -hmm. and actually mentioned in her presentation that she was unable to relate to much of what she was teaching and much of what she was delivering. How does that hit you? What do you think about that? It's like trying to solve the problem, but not taking like the problem into consideration. Like you can't identify with the problem. So you can't really, you can sympathize, but not really because it's not like your issue to solve. So I feel like you have to take into consideration those my those marginalized groups. And you also have to sometimes, like even when we had that presentation, kind of step aside and make way for someone that does have, that can oh. identify with those marginalized groups <laughs> and to have them sometimes like, yes, that's great. You have this expertise in this subject, but you don't have the lived experience. And right. sometimes the lived experience mm -hmm. outweighs the expertise. Absolutely agree with that. And I know mm -hmm. some people may not agree because, you know, there's there's this concept of allyship, which we rely on and believe in. And we want white people. We want people with privilege to leverage their privilege to help us uh, with this equity work. But the, I agree. And it's OK to disagree on this forum. Uh, if you do so, please put it in the chat or, or our panelists can speak up. I agree that a certain amount of lived experience with just being disenfranchised no matter what the issue is, right? Like sensitizes you differently to doing the work. I will give you an example, and this is probably a poor example, but I'm going to give it anyway. Um, this past uh, February, I was at a event and well-intentioned, there was um, a young lady who rendered the uh, Negro National Anthem in the room. She was white. And there were many black singers in the room, myself included. And I sat there appreciating her wanting to do that for Black History Month, but then wondering why she didn't step aside and let let someone who, you know, who had lived uh, with that being part of their cultural experience to express that. So I just wonder, and I know there are different vantage points on who can do this work. You know, is it an educational qualification? Is it a qualification that comes from lived experience and being able to relate? You know, what does that look like? What do you think, Bernard? I think it's all of the above. I mean, you know, you got to make sure you have the right people doing this work. Um, but then they have to have the right focus. And something that goes uh, with the right focus is, you know, is the work that they're really thinking about doing, is it relevant? Um, are there metrics attached to it? Um, do they have benchmarks? Mm -hmm. um, because as we know, doing this work, there's no one size that fits all. So you have to figure out and learn and take that time to learn and be humble enough to figure out through those lived experiences, you know, is this going to work? And it's still something that, that John said, he used the word strategy. I think strategy is probably one of the most important things when we talk about that, um, because you want to make sure that it's, you know, it has a, a it's not only is it relevant, but is it achievable? Um, is it inspiring to do this work? Um, is, there, is there any level of flexibility? So we got to think about all those things because the strategy has got to be set at the different levels, the macro and the micro, you know, to ensure that there's going to be a measurable change in this work that we're doing. 
I love that. And to lend to something John said earlier as well, none of us are monoliths, right? So even I can be a person, I can be a Black person and cannot speak for all Black people, cannot relate to all Black people. And so I do believe that probably the answer is somewhere in the middle of what I'm asking all of you. Uh, <laughs> what I want to do is turn to your lived experience. Um, we're going to circle back after that and talk a little bit about some of the ways that DEI advocates like we are face adversity in doing the work. But first, I would love to know your lived experience of being an advocate for diversity and inclusion, why you've chosen this work, what it means to you, and then maybe some of the obstacles you've encountered while doing it. Open the floor for that. Wow. I'll go first. You know, um, and I'll say this from the heart. I, I just think that because it takes so much time and effort to achieve this work, you know, getting people to really join in um, and understand why you do this work. Um, I remember, you know, my dad telling my brothers and I, do something that you really like to do, that you want to get up every day and do. And so with this work and the type of work that we do here at Associated Black Charities, you know, I feel like that I want to win for people every day. So I need to be my best when I come. I need to make sure and check myself every day that I'm I'm still believing in this work, that I still want to do this work, that I still want to obtain this work. And just, you know, in speaking from the heart, everybody deserves the opportunity to have that, uh, to be a part of something, to be included in something. Um, so with that, you know, the, having diverse cultures and creating an environment of empowerment. So those are kind of the lived experience that I think about and really what, drives me to do this work every day. Um, it's, it's not about chasing a dollar. It's really about trying to win. Um, and I feel like the the road that was paved for us to get where we are today, we have to continue to pave that road for those who are ahead. Okay. John? Yeah. Um, I'll share a, a story. Um, so I uh, have a master's in social work. Uh, and I went to a, so I attended an MSW program where me and other students uh, were, part, uh, we were kind of leading uh, some efforts to um, address what we thought were issues of racism within the program uh, and how, you know, I would criticize social work programs as oftentimes like using uh marginalized people in Baltimore as like uh like a a lab for students to learn on um and so we were trying to address some of these issues uh, and that brought uh you know us students uh, in conflict with the administration at times um and so one thing that happened was uh so in a, in a social work program you do field education uh, you have a field placement where you're you're like an intern and you're learning etc and uh, as part of that, you have your supervisor and you have like a liaison who uh, kind of makes sure that you're checking all the boxes for the program. Um, and so there was a meeting with my supervisor, with the liaison and the other students under that supervisor. And so, you know, kind of each of the students reported back on what they were doing, et cetera. And when it came to me, I reported back what I was doing. And the liaison started like getting really intense and like coming down really hard on me. Like, why haven't you checked this off? Why haven't you done this report? Why then? like uh, addressing some, a bunch of uh, things. And so she was like being really harsh with me. And I was like, oh, I must be really messing up like my field placement. Um, but when I talked to the students, other students afterwards, they're like, yeah, we also don't have those reports. And like, it's kind of like paperwork that you kind of do at the end of the semester and so on. It's weird that she really focused on you. And then my field supervisor was like, yeah, that was really strange. Uh, one thing I noticed was like right before the meeting, I saw her talking to this administrator. Uh, did you do something to piss off this administrator? Um, and that is like the person who would often be representing the dean, et cetera, in these meetings with my group. Um, and yeah, it, it was just like, uh, that really sh stuck out to me because not only was like, oh, I'm actually like, I feel like I'm being targeted because I'm criticizing an administration, uh, but also like in my group, like um, there were a lot of like white students in the group trying to put in this effort as well. And they, none of them, none of the white students faced this kind of pushback. So it wasn't just that 
I got pushback uh, because I was critiquing the, the school, but I got pushback because I was a student of color critiquing the school. Hmm. And so that's why, because you've got to finish the site. That's why you <laughs> devoted for this, gave you the passion to be devoted to this work. <laughs> that's part of it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Chevelle? <laughs> Um, my devotion to this work really comes from being a part of something that's bigger than myself and being able to make an impact. I felt like kind of before doing this, I've always kind of struggled like, well, what's going to be like my mark? Like I never wanted to be like famous or anything, but I still wanted to make a mark and make an impact no matter how big or how small that was. Um, and growing up, you know, here in Baltimore City, I've seen a ton of things. I've seen disparities. I've seen people being placed out on the street. Um, and I've been lucky that I haven't had those experiences. And I've also realized, like, in me, that is lucky. But there are some people that, like, want to do better. But they really just have all of these obstacles that they really can't shake. And some of these obstacles are no fault to theirs. It's just some of these systematic barriers that are in place. So with doing this work, I feel like I'm able to help as you know, with our mission with Associated Black Charities to break down some of those barriers and then to be able to uplift, you know, Black people and other marginalized groups as well. So this is really just my way of being able to give back, make an impact in the lives of Black people and begin to break down those barriers to also, you know, make a better future for my daughter and husband as well. Perfect. So you all have devoted yourselves, your careers, your professional lives, and probably much of your personal lives to this equity work. And now let's talk about some ways that equity advocates, whether you do it professionally or you just do it because you're civic minded and you want to push the work forward, uh, face adversity in trying to do the work. Um, you know, what are some of the ways, and we'll talk about them, that as we push our cause forward for inclusivity, for equity, you know, ultimately for liberation, um, that we begin to face, I think, challenges that are because of what we're referring to as diversity fatigue. People who are saying, like Bernard mentioned earlier, enough. Like, is this all we're going to talk about? Haven't we done enough? Haven't we, you know, uh, given you, you know, enough time and resources and focuses on this work? And one of the things that I used to say um, as I would do this work is it's the what about me syndrome, right? Because sometimes when you're focusing on people of color and you're focusing on disparity, other people begin to feel like that that it is at their expense, and that they are being, and their interests and needs are being neglected. So that's one thing that advocates might face. What are some other ways that advocates face adversity in your experiences? Um, I would say the biggest for me would be really that skepticism around it. As you mentioned, people are like, we've been doing this for three years. Like we checked the box, we've hired a black president and CEO, but my thinking is like, well, does that person may be in power, but do they really have authority? Do they have the authority to make changes that are going to impact other people? So while you're saying like this person may be in a higher position, like what type of authority do they have? Are they able to bring other people along in their journey as well? So really battling that skepticism because there's been such that big push on DEI over the past three years. People are like, we checked this box. We've checked that box. Like what more could you possibly need? And it's kind of overcoming that barrier to say that this person is in position, but we are still need to make progress for what they're doing as well. So you're talking about two two whole different obstacles combined together, the skepticism, but also tokenism, which is a big part uh, that has showed up in this work as people have checked the box by putting people of color in positions of leadership, but not necessarily resourcing them or empowering them. And these people of color are considered to be representatives of their entire marginalized group. Right, rather than representing their own accomplishments, experiences, and expert and areas of expertise, and they check the box. So, how could we possibly be a racist organization if we have Chrissy or John as the CEO? How could we possibly be a racist organization if we've hired four people that look like us on the Zoom tonight? You know, like those are those are contraindicative toward the diversity work that we're trying to push forward. So absolutely, thank you for bringing those forward. Any other areas of adversity to this work that you guys want to lift? I would say trying to, um, you know, find like-minded folks in the work or mm -hmm. um, really being able to, to find your community of folks who are thinking and on the same page as you are. Um, I think to the point that Chevelle made, you know, that's, starting to scale down and shrink a little bit. You know, it's like, um, you know, you don't hear people talk about affirmative action anymore. 
at some point, the words DEI are going to go away. People won't even use the term DEI. It'll probably be a new term uh, whenever that may be. So trying to find your community and stick with that community who's going to help move this work forward it is a, a major adversity. Um, you know, and I, I hate to be repetitive, but it's really true. Some people just are getting tired of hearing about it and they're saying, okay, well, we need to be on to the next thing. What's next after DEI? You know, you know, we, we've had Barack, um, you know, we've had this, but what's next? So, um, we, we got to figure out what that next thing is. Um, so we have to be ready and prepared for that change, no matter what form it may take on. Now I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to put you guys on the spot and ask you when you're hearing out as you're in the communities and in corporations and organizations, you're hearing people express either openly or, you know, um, just express to you fatigue with these efforts, feeling like it is cumbersome, it's too much, enough. What are your responses to that? I can tell you my response, but what? how do you respond to that? How do you challenge that? I'll tell you my response is, if you think it is tired talking about this stuff, right. hiring, can you imagine living a living whole it. life where every moment of every day, you know, is a, a, a contribution to your lived experience of being, you know, a victim of racism? Like, can you imagine? And most people can't. Can you? Because we don't talk about racism enough you know it's not a comfortable conversation it's not necessarily you know what we go to the networking events and <laughs> have discourse over it's not what we talk about at the water cooler at work all of the time but even when we're not talking about it as a black woman i'm always living with it i'm always second guessing what's happening around me with it can you imagine how tiring that is so if you're tired of hearing about it or listening to it, can you imagine what that is? So that's my rebuttal. What's yours? As people are constantly wondering, like, when is enough enough? Hmm. I would say mine is probably very similar to yours. Like, if you're tired of hearing it, like, I'm probably tired of living with these experiences and thinking, like, even, like, if my husband goes out, like, making sure, like, he doesn't dress in, like, super clothes and, you know, granted, he's pretty small, but still just making sure that he doesn't do anything that's intimidating, like, making sure that he doesn't go out, like, super late at night so he's not profiled. So it's always, like, those worries and things that are always floating in the back of our heads. So it's kind of, like, hard sometimes to hear people, like, oh, they're tired of it. And it's, like, we can't pull away from it. Like, you're able to, like, disconnect yourselves from it, but we don't have that ability or that option to do that. It's amazing. And John, before you go, someone in the chat wrote, I'm not sure how there would be anyone who thinks that hundreds of years of inequity baked into the fabric of spaces could be undone after a couple of years. That's profound. Yeah. That John, your profound. thoughts about confronting fatigue with diversity work? Yeah. Um, first, I want to call out Devin is a board pipeliner. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second of all, I think one thing is I, I want to echo everything that you both Chrissy and Chevelle just said. And I think uh, this is not like instead of, but in addition to, I think one of the reasons that sometimes you hear this from people, especially people in, you know, uh, nonprofits or corporations is because it comes from after the years of DI trainings, et cetera, that don't, then, you know, that we've talked about, like that don't produce results. Mm -hmm. that are kind of like for gestures that the organization does or it's kind of like to check a box and so I think one of the things I see in like the work that I do is like when I am doing anti-racist work that I think is like impactful and meaningful it gives me energy and it gives me momentum and I think when we see when we're doing work and we're and we see it, it goes nowhere that the organization kind of just like it's another checkbox that the organization has or so on, like that is what drains energy. And when it's, you know, engaging with kind of like the white moderate who um, will say like, oh, racial equity is an important thing, but like, that's what drains my energy. And so I think sometimes when people say, you know, I, I'm tired of DEI, it's the problem of the DEI that they are engaged in, that doesn't feel empowering, that doesn't feel impactful, that doesn't create change. And so one of the things I would say is like, 
you're probably feeling that way because like you're going through these trainings and you don't see anything actually changing in your organization. There are like, people aren't feeling more rewarded. People aren't more engaged. People aren't, um, uh, there aren't, you know, the workforce is not becoming more diverse. People are not being compensated better and so on. And so that's why it feels like another job duty as opposed to something that is, liberating which ultimately like justice work should be right it should be liberating uh but it doesn't feel that way because it's being done wrong so is justice work liberating to those that injustice benefits mm. I would say yes. <laughs> and i say that to say <laughs> I say that as a as a question for you all, something that we consistently have to think about is that there is a subset of people who benefit from lack of diversity, right? And, you know, Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand because people don't want to volunteer to become disempowered. So that is the biggest challenge of some of this equity work is that the powers that be in, in the chat earlier, someone mentioned about authority and who makes the decisions and resources. The powers that be are not necessarily incentivized to prioritize this work. So as we are equity professionals and we are encouraging professionals, allies, advocates who are on the call with us this evening to continue to push the work forward, how do you fight against the powers that be not having intrinsic incentives to push equity forward. Mm. Wow. Well, you guys sound defeating. Now I'm not passionate uh, about the work because we all don't have a pathway to any progress. No, well, I, I, I would say for me, I mean, I think um, you have to keep showing the value of this work. Okay, I think that is key. You have to show the value of what this work means. Um, people have to see it because sometimes you hear some people say, "Well, you keep that DEI stuff over there. That I don't want to hear that. You know, that doesn't pertain to me. Um, I'm doing fine. You know, I've achieved everything I've wanted to do. Um, they don't, and I hate to say it. There's a lot of people who look just like me to say, "Hey, you know." Uh, racism hasn't really knocked on my door lately. So, you know, I'm not really worried about it. I'm just trying to take care of myself, take care of my family. So, so some people want to exclude themselves from the conversation until something happens. Mm -hmm. And then they're the first ones running, you know, to uh, EEOC right. or to their yeah. supervisor saying, you know, hey, I've been discriminated against. Oh, hey, I think I've been a victim of racism. So I think there's also a heavy lack of under misunderstanding of what DEI is all about. And I think a lot of people just don't understand it. Um, so they shy away from it or they run away from it or they try to talk it down because they really don't understand it. So I think, you know, um, being able to tell the stories of DEI, you know, that's something you hear now, you hear that phrase, we have to tell the story. So I think we have to tell this story about DEI, its impact, its uh, effectiveness, um, you know, the emotions that go with it. Um, there's there's so much involved with this DEI work. I think a lot of people just clearly don't understand it, Kristen. And on the on the note that you just brought up, not only is there so much involved in it, but we can look at DEI and equity work from a business scenario perspective. And we can start to look at the cost to organizations who don't readily embrace moving the needle forward on equity. And right. so let's talk about a couple of those now. Um, we know that if and when e equity efforts begin to diminish, to lessen, or to disappear, there will be, and probably for many organizations have already started to realize, real costs and consequences to that, to not investing in this work, to not keeping it in the forefront, it will affect the overall success and ultimately the sustainability of businesses and organizations. And one of the heaviest costs is loss of talent. Mm -hmm. And so we know that retention, specifically post-COVID, is an issue for most businesses. This is a, a financial issue. So when we start to talk about how lack of equity affects the bottom line, that is when potentially some of our you know, uh, privileged decision makers and organizations 
who can understand it from a financial perspective can begin to see some of the value possibly. So when we talk about loss of talent, we talk about how alienating, isolating, and disincluding people in the workplace causes a departure. We've talked all year long about how when, when Black people in particular are not valued, not respected, not treated equitably, what do we do? Either we leave or we do not bring our best selves, which is probably uh, not just a Black people thing. That is what how most people would respond to that kind of treatment. So when employees don't feel valued and, or included, they're more likely to seek opportunities elsewhere or what we've seen this great migration to, to entrepreneurship. So what do we think about loss of talent in particular um, as one of the costs of not focusing on equity? Um, I think the loss of talent greatly impacts the organization because I feel like you're not even recognizing the values that your employee brings. And we also know how much it costs to have to retrain mm -hmm. and rebring in an employee. But And that cycle will continue if you still don't put these practices into place. So if I leave and then you bring someone that's similar to me, but you still don't have these strategies in place, then that's just still going to lead to the next person that comes behind me leaving. And it keeps you know an assembly line of employees and you don't have employees that are really invested into the work and into the mission of the organization. So I, then that begins to fail. It also leads to a negative reputation with the organization um, as well. And you know, with this world of social media, it's so easy to write a news article or post, uh, TikTok, and just get the word out there. So that also, you know, leads to negative consequences on that way and also being able to get the word of mouth about the negative reputation that the organization has at lightning speed. Absolutely. <laughs> It could be detrimental for an organization, you know, with that loss of talent. Um, it could be a really great company, but they may just be um, kind of doing their strategies in a backward way. Um, they may have great intentions, but maybe have the wrong people um, doing this type of work. So that that loss of talent, you know, can be very critical and very detrimental um, to those organizations. You know, you see these organizations now, Chrissy, are actually starting to get rid of the DEI officers at work because they will say, oh, well, the HR, um, you know, generalists or specialists can handle that. Um, so they're removing a lot of these folks out of these positions um, that they thought they needed, you know, between the last three and five years. But now we see a lot of those positions are starting to diminish or they're getting new cute titles um, where, where it changes um, because the, the focus is no longer on DEI like it used to be. So with that change, you know, that loss of talent is is is, is going to be critical and, and detrimental to organizations. Mm -hmm. Also, let's look at what it means when workforces aren't diverse. And John, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. We know that when there's no diversity in organizations, that there's reduced creativity, innovation, but also perspective, right? So we're talking about people who are in the workforce who are able to help the company problem solve, who are able to speak on behalf of their communities, who are able to bring forward nuanced ideas. When diversity is not valued, how do those things start to affect a company's bottom line and maybe trigger some interest from the powers that be to push diversity forward? Sorry, could you repeat that last When we're, when we're maybe having uh, a lack of diversity in the workforce that then reduces perspective, problem solving, innovation, and creativity, how can that uh, be detrimental to an organization? Yeah, uh, I think, um, you know, kind of going back to uh, the metaphor we're using with like the blueprint, I think when you have... Um, that lack of diversity, we, I think we have like tunnel vision that can happen or like group think where that blueprint starts to like drifts from away from like where it should be. Uh, it's because like, <laughs> uh, so for example, like if we only have like people who like really care about bathrooms, like building that blueprint, like they're going to be building the most beautiful bathrooms in that lean to right and so we need people who who like have to bring can bring the perspective of like we when we're building this house like we have to be looking at we need someone who is an expert in like the foundation and we'd be able to put it where it is in the ground we need people who are able to like talk about like uh the weather and weatherization energy efficiency etc um and i think that lack of diversity limits the people's ability to see the problems 
that the organization or the business is trying to solve. Um, yeah, and I think uh, one thing, kind of going answering this question, but also going back to the previous, um, is for example, like, uh, so a lot of my work is like focused on the nonprofit sector and some of the surveys within like the Baltimore area and across nationally is that we often find that uh, people of color within nonprofits actually don't see themselves wanting to advance within organizations. They actually wanna leave their organizations and they wanna start their own. And um, I think that's part of like organizations failing to create this culture where they wanna cultivate their own talent and so, you know, black workers or other workers of color feel like, why do I want to advance in a racist organization? Why won't why wouldn't I take my talent and do something and build something myself? Um, and I think if organizations don't address this problem, they're going to see, you know, their most talented people leave. Because even if you have, for example, people that are theoretically included, like white people, uh, white workers, ma male workers, et cetera, like oftentimes like people talented people also don't want to work, like even if they're not directly affected by racism, talented white people also don't want to work at a racist organization uh, and so on. Like, And so they would also be leaving and going to the organizations being started by the black leaders who are leaving. Absolutely. So let me ask this and then we'll go on to some, uh, talk about some tips and make sure that we've answered any questions that are in the Q&A. Make sure you're putting your questions in the Q&A or your thoughts in the, in the, in the chat. Um, what is the obligation of people of color or Black people in organizations to do this work? Is there one? Or is it okay for Black people, even in a racist, racist environment, to go to work, do the job, collect their check, and go home? Do we carry the burden or a responsibility to be advocates for diversity and equity in our, in our organizations? I can start. Um, I think we do carry the burden, but I try not to look at Black people that don't want to step up and be like the face of diversity, equity, inclusion in their space, like in a negative light, because I feel like life is already heavy enough. And maybe this work is just one more thing that like Black people can't do. So I think that is important why people like our organization, Associated Black Charities and other organizations like us, we step in for those people that feel like enough is enough. Like I really can't take on one more thing, but then they have people like us to be able to champion for them in case there's like, this is just like one more thing that they can't do. Some people don't feel empowered to do it as well. So I feel like um, it is our goal to also empower people, especially through these webinars, to give them those tips and things that they can use to eventually be advocates um, and they can uh -huh. tap into that untapped potential that they don't even realize that they have. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think you also gotta be willing to be a risk taker and everybody's not willing to be a risk taker. Mm -hmm. um, they're waiting for you to step up before they step up. And a lot of people are gripped by fear too. Um, they don't want to be quote unquote, the, you know, the empowered or uh, enlightened or the woke black person uh, because they may fear that that may cost them their job. Uh, so some folks just sit silent and then they wait for you to step forward um, and let you take all the shots and arrows you know, on their behalf. But the minute you get a big win for everybody, everybody's going to rally behind you and line up behind you. So I think a lot of people are just gripped with fear, but it is an awesome responsibility and the weight definitely rests on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. John, your thoughts? Yeah, I will definitely uh, not speak for Black people uh, as a non-Black person, uh, but I will Thank say- you. <laughs> Uh, but I will say, like, as, you know, as an Asian person, I think it is, uh, I have, I, I sometimes have, like, relatively hot takes for, so I do think it is the obligation of Asian Americans to be standing up, stepping up and standing up within organizations, within workplace, et cetera, in the United States. I think the advancements that the the ability of Asian people in the United States to live the way in relative freedom, et cetera, uh, is because of the work that Black justice workers have done in the past uh, in the past decades, in the past centuries. And it is part of our obligation to that movement to be a part of that. Uh, so again, not speaking for Black people, I will say if you're Asian, you need to be, you need to care about anti-Black racism, in addition to 
racism in general. Um, and you need to be putting uh, your work, your et cetera, online. Yeah, I agree, John. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, Chevelle gave people a pass and I'm like, no, you get no pass, right? No. <laughs> Sometimes, and I get that some people are gripped with fear. Some people don't see themselves as advocates. Um, some people are not built to fight the battle. And I get all of those things. But sometimes when we sit silent in the midst of harm, we perpetuate it and avail that harm to other people. And so I think, yes, these webinars are intended to give people the tools to navigate, to remove themselves from, from spaces, but certainly silence is a response. And I think when we sit kind of silently in areas that are meant to harm people that look like us, that we become complicit in some ways. And so, yes, we need to educate people. We need to empower people. We need to put systems in place to protect people um, because we can't afford to have people sitting in spaces that are perpetuating the harm that that's being done to people in, in the workplace. All yeah. right. So let's see what uh, we have some comments in the chat that we can address this says most marginalized people no matter the race don't have the luxury of dealing with causes now that too i agree with so i'm all over the place i agree with that but i also feel like we gotta do something about it it says they are often uh focused on survival anyone want to comment to that um i think that was also kind of the point that i eventually was trying to get to i think and there's also kind of a gratitude i think with certain people reach certain levels maybe in their career or in life they just don't want to rock the boat. So they're just like, I'm here, I'm good. Like, I know it's a little bit of injustice, but it may affect me, it may not affect me, but like, I just kind of don't want to kind of go backwards. So they kind of, you know, have that gratitude as well. And again, not everyone has that privilege to be a rebel shaker, you know, a rebel rouser, and then could potentially lose their job or could potentially be isolated. So there are a bunch of different factors, I think, that yeah. go into that. What do you think, but before we move on from that, what do you think builds that? Like, you know, we didn't, the four of us, didn't wake up, we weren't born as like, you know, movement people, you know, what shaped our willingness and not just this job, um, cause I'm assuming we all felt the, the way we feel and we're passionate about causes outside of this job and would be without this career. What feeds that, what builds that, what has changed? You know, we talk about this new generation where they're not as movement focused, right? Are, are we still passing down the, mantle for this work in our in our families and in our traditions or has that faded away hmm i think that well you so know, this says hip hop wanna... hip hop hip hop <laughs> <laughs> 50 years, NWA. <laughs> 50 years of hip hop <clears throat> i i think um you know when you look back through history i mean you see that um when you think about the civil rights movement Folks were down for the cause. They were fighting. It didn't matter. Everybody was out there uh, marching, fighting for it. Um, and and no disrespect to this, um, you know, to the younger group now. I mean, I have kids who will, who fall into this category. <clears throat> and Chrissy, I'll be honest, I just don't see that. I see the movement in a different realm. I don't see the movement um, for challenging the status quo to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, okay. A lot of folks are concerned about their bottom line, the things that they have, the things that they like to enjoy. They don't want any of that disturbed. So they're not willing to take that chance, to take that risk, um, maybe as we have. I mean, I know for myself, I've taken many risks. Um, there's a risk being here at ABC. I mean, there's a fear that um, funders, you know, if, if if your organization is is funder based and you're always going after this funding, that that funding will dry up and, you know, then there goes your bottom line. So I think a lot of people are so comfortable where they are. Um, as Chevelle said, they don't want to rock that boat. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's hard to get a lot of people. But I think, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, For I'll speak for myself, we're very conscious about what's going on. I think we've seen so much that has happened and has transpired before our eyes. You know, we can't act like this 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 work doesn't exist and that there's a lot more work to be done. So I think that's, for me, that's what keeps me alert um, and focused and involved in this work so deeply. Okay. Anyone else? 
my friend. Sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about, uh, we talked about people being fearful of the work and, you know, what's changed over the years of, you know, um, kind of feeling responsible. And John talked about, you know, almost being obligated, right? To participate in in movement work because it has allowed a, a lot of us to accomplish the things that we've had. And then we, we kind of, according to Bernard, um, put that aside to just kind of relish on the fact that we've made it and not necessarily feel like we are compelled as people to do the work anymore. Is it I do. The, you know, what, what's changed in how we're raising children, how we're talking to them about racism or how we're talking about racism in general? Um, well, I know growing up a lot of the history of like black people and slavery was taught to us in schools. I know a lot of that is now being removed. I can remember like vividly taking trips to like the Blacks and Wax Museum while I was in school, having to watch movies like Our Friend Martin. So that kind of being like constantly ingrained to us. And I know there's starting to be a shift where we're pulling that type of stuff out of schools. And if families aren't talking about it at home, it's like, where are the kids getting mm -hmm. that information from? Like, of course, of course, we have a bunch of movies, but is that like, impactful do people want to see that like one of my favorite movies recently has been Judas and the Black Messiah I love that movie um, it's so good um but what is gearing like the younger generation to view it in that perspective like it's kind of like oh well we have it good now are they seeing Black people being hosed down are they seeing Black people getting beating are they seeing like the bombings in Montgomery like what type of information are they even seeing or like even aware of it to even see that like We've made so much progress, but if the progress st stops, this is we can easily revert back to the things that were happening in the 50s, 60s, and And we and see it, right? And then we all get like irate. So when we yeah. see Trayvon Martin happen, now it's time to rally and protest. Right. When we see George Floyd that, and it takes that to be a constant reminder of how the world spins. And I really just think it's that we don't openly talk about racism enough. And Bernard knows we've been talking this year mm -hmm. on how to avail like our constituents and our ABC community to be able to give tell their testimonies about racism. Mm -hmm. Because when we don't talk about it, we don't put it yeah, in the it's like it swept under the Some rug. Some people feel like it doesn't exist to the right. extent that it does uh, anymore. But I can share probably 10 stories in the past four weeks um, about myself and people close to me where they experienced situations with overt racism, right? That harmed them either physically, emotionally, mentally, or, you know, with their job progression or something else. But I think we just don't talk about those things anymore, right? Is it just, right. you know, too burdensome to, to, to carry that in the forefront anymore? I'm wondering. So just, just dialogue around that. No, that's um, a good point. If I, if yeah. I may, I think that's a good point because I was having a conversation with a gentleman today and it was, um, we were talking about so many things as two African-American men, um, but we were talking about how we can advance some of this work and, you know, how he could do some stuff with ABC, but we didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about racism. And he knows the type of work that I do, but he didn't talk about it from that context. He talked about it from a safety standpoint because he's more so worried about keeping what he has, living the way he does, mm. being able to have the privileges and the things um, that he has. Now, I'm not saying that he has forgotten about, you know, all the struggles and, and where we've come from as a people, but it's not something that he is, um, you know, leaning towards right now to have that open conversation and that open dialogue. I mean, some people just aren't taking that chance, Christy, to talk about. So now I'm going to give myself a shameless plug with ABC and we're going to be launching a little <laughs> podcast um, opportunity very shortly called Less We Forget, which I'm really excited about because as you know, I was talking to one of our colleagues the other day and we were talking about the paper bag theory and he was like, what? And I'm like, what? And then we talked about some other historical references and he was like, what? And I'm realizing that it's not us that are removing these topics from school. Mm -hmm. It is not us that's removing this education from schools. We're also very much disconnected from faith communities the way we used to be, where it was used to be the place where we would learn a lot of these things. And so we're going to make sure that ABC is in the forefront of making sure that we don't forget the impetus behind the work that we're doing um, with equity work. But we're gonna turn now to making sure that we empower those who are on tonight because you are on tonight because you wanted to know how to fight diversity fatigue. And we want to empower you to 
support communities of color, other marginalized communities, specifically black community, um, as far as ABC is concerned, in pushing racial and equity initiatives forward to keep this work in the mm -hmm. forefront and prevalent and strong in the face of all the types of adversity we've discussed. And so we're going to talk about a few ways that you can do that. We'll hear from our panelists and make sure that you share any ways in the chat or in the Q&A that you would like to put forward too. So the first way that we've researched says to build a coalition of allies, which means that you would be fostering a network of allies, both within your organization and outside of your organization who are committed to racial equity, as you are. And we know that you would then be leveraging the collective efforts of more than just your own voice. So what do we feel about building coalition of allies? And do you all have any examples of how that's being done well, maybe here in Baltimore? Yes. Um, and that's kind of what I, a, a point I touched on earlier about finding your community. Um, mm -hmm. Finding that community is actually building a coalition of your allies, you know, like-minded folks, folks who are actually doing the type of work. Um, because I think the more collaborative efforts that we have um, in this realm, we, it's only going to advance the work um, even further. Um, you know, I give big shout out to um, Jamie Wooten, the work that he's doing with Collectively. I think um, he has definitely set the bar high for this type of um, coalition of allies, for bringing folks under Absolutely. an umbrella um, who do this type of work and who really care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So he would be the example. That organization would be the example that first comes to my mind. Perfect. Any other thoughts about building coalitions of allies? Yes, I would also like to do a shameless ABC plug as well. Um, over the summer, we put together our Black Racial Equity Organization Summit, where we brought together um, different racial equity organizations throughout the city of Baltimore, just to really learn what each organization was doing, what they were doing well, which ways that we we're able to collaborate and kind of build, you know, community around the work that we're doing. Um, so that's something that we are doing at ABC. Um, we continue to meet with those organizations on a quarterly um, basis to kind of put together different efforts and just, I'm sorry, and also just a continuation to learn continuously what each organization is continued to doing and how we can be in partnership to that organization to lend our resources and voices because we do realize that we are stronger together and as we come together as allies. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Yeah, uh, this is another ABC Ally, uh, but ABC has... Uh, you know, over the past, it started under Claire. So I would say like the past six years, uh, ABC had convened the community practice for um, organization, uh, workforce development organizations to talk about uh, the issues within workforce and racial inequity and how, for, for example, occupational segregation. Why is it that uh, people going through nursing programs, the black trainees oftentimes, uh, for example, uh, get stuck in the CNA space, whereas mm -hmm. the white trainees get moved up to R RN trainees and are to get their degrees to become registered nurses. Uh, talking about um, how for one of the things that uh, the community practice has like talked about is like how can us organize like our workforce development training programs and so on. How are we able to like exert pressure on employers? How can we exert pressure on so on to be better to be better employers so that we're not just, you know, getting people into whatever job can take them, but like how can we actually build better jobs for black Baltimoreans? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, you know, I um I agree with what Chevel and John said. I mean, I, I I disagree that this, I mean, I agree that this is um to focus in the direction that we need to be going. Um, I think ABC is at a pinnacle time right now for change. Um, even under our rebranding, I think the things that we're offering to the community are super valuable resources. Um, they're life-changing. And, you know, I encourage folks to get involved with ABC. And that is my shameless plug for ABC. <laughs> and likely we're going to keep doing that throughout the, the, the remainder of the webinar. But <laughs> let's talk a little bit about continuous education, because if you're going to be a self-proclaimed racial equity advocate, it is important that you stay abreast of racial equity issues. 
of course, that you would know the historical context to these issues and be able to relate them to modern day events. We know that knowledge is the most powerful tool to be an effective advocate and that you have to be willing to be a continual learner to be able to approach your equity work with information and from an informed position. Where are we getting this information? So how are you all staying abreast of what's needed um, where are you, where are you informed? Where are you continuously learning? And um, how can we offer some of those uh, opportunities to our listeners tonight? Hmm. Um, I would say for me, um, I do do some um, information over social media by following some of the different news sources. Also, LinkedIn is a great tool. And Chrissy does love to send the ABC staff lots of articles as well as Bernard. So that's always um, helpful as well. I would say also having alerts on your phones to things that are relevant so that when those things come up in the news and things like that, that you're able to get those instant alerts and being able to stay up to date on any current, thing, um, current events and things that are relevant towards DEI work as well. Perfect. Where else are you all getting information, staying attuned to what the needs are and learning about equity work? I mean, there's a lot of great information out there. A couple that come to my mind um, is Policy Link. Policy Link is a great resource, um, very valuable um, information. What uh, Ms. Glover has done over decades of work, um, of, of, of data proven work, um, so policy link is definitely a, a great resource and some of the, um, information that comes even out of the Brookings Institute, um, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of great research that has come out of that as well. So there's a lot of good data out there, um, that can keep you attuned and abreast to some of the changes and nuances that are taking place in this DI space space because it is changing. And I think it may have been John who said it earlier, you know, in a, in a couple of years, a couple of months, or maybe a couple of hours, the stuff is going to change. The language is going to change. Um, so organizations like that, I think, offer some very valuable information. Uh, so, yeah, I, de I definitely want to echo Policy Link. Uh, I also think the Aspen Institute has a lot of great resources. Uh, just in general, like, um, I think oftentimes, like if you talk to, especially if you talk to, again, workers of color within uh, nonprofits, a common refrain is like, we know the work that needs to be done. Like we know what needs to happen. It's just that people aren't willing to do it. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of great research on what has worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, I think just in general, like one of the things you, I would, uh, say is uh, suggest is if you look up reports that are saying things that you that are really resonating with you and so on reaching out to the people who read who wrote those reports i think are oftentimes very happy to talk about their research and can oftentimes like share additional insights uh that maybe couldn't be published or weren't published or were cut in editing and so on uh i i know i've talked to uh over the past uh few months like i've talked to a number of people at policy lane and just uh, be able to get insight into the work that they've done has been really has been really great. Yeah. And I think also none of you said this and it's okay because I'm going to bring it forward. But I think when you're engaging in racial equity work, the, the best learning opportunities are going to be within the communities that you're advocating for. And so obviously ABC has engaged in a number of listening sessions throughout the year, community convos that are very important to us. And I think what we learn and will be prepared mm -hmm. to report out in the process is that the things that we were prescribing to be the number one top issues in communities were us kind of baking those theories up in a sterile room, not having contact and interaction and integration within those communities. But when you go out into communities and start to talk to Black people and start to talk to this group of people or that group of people, they can articulate. If nothing, nothing else, they can articulate where their uh, pressure points are, where the issues are, what's urgent and what's working well, which is good to know too. And so even in your organizations, if you are being a racial equity advocate and you're advocating for people of color um, in at the workplace, it's important to make sure that you're hearing from other people of color right. in your advocacy. And it's probably the best learning opportunity because nowadays between social media and the news, you have to be very careful where you are gathering information um, to make sure that it's not biased and that it's accurate. Um, there are reports even of what's going on in Baltimore that would sway one way. And then you the next day you can hear a report that sways the other way. So it's important for you to actually have your finger to the pulse of different 
communities. So thank you guys for sharing that. And how should people in this equity work, because we can't assume that because we are racial equity people, that we care about diversity work, that we don't also come with our own implicit biases. That possibly, you know, um, I think shade the way we approach the work that possibly, you know, may make us inadequate in how we do the work on some days. How do we start to address that so that we can be even more effective? Our own implicit biases. What do you think about that? Hmm. I think a big part is, you know, that continuous learning uh, that we just talked about, you know, continuing to like challenge how we think and so on. I think part of that is having people who uh, can be can hold you accountable and you're in mm-hmm. how you live your life and how you do your work. Uh, you know, and it could be someone at work, but also just like you're a personal friend or a mentor or so on who can kind of check you um, and see, you know, you say these are your values, like is how you're working and how you're doing things, living up to those values. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. I'll also add while uh, Chevelle and Bernard are, are thinking of your responses, that while we understand that racism is heavy, it's unrelenting, it is you know generational, its impact has is uncompromising, it also isn't responsible for everything. And so I think sometimes, you know, um our biases, even in the the portrayers of this work, make us sometimes prescribe everything to racism. <laughs> and you know, I've as a as a manager, I've often managed people and watched other people, and you know, I've I've cringed when I've seen people leverage racism when that's that, that's not it, sis. It was you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it didn't have nothing to do with that because you begin to undermine some of the efforts. So I think in one way is that as you know, um, people who are pushing this work forward, we have to be conscious of, you know, are we misclassifying people's intentions and efforts, you know maybe not even intentionally based on our own biases. So that's something I'll offer. Bernard? Yeah, I I, I, I agree with that, Chrissy. Um, but I think, as, as John kind of said, you have to be willing to look in the mirror and be accountable for your own actions. Um, and if you do, and, and I, I believe, I agree with you. I think everybody has their own form of implicit biases. But I think you have to, when you're doing this type of work, uh, it's going to be important for you to kind of keep your implicit biases at bay because if not, it will affect the work that you are able, uh, that you're trying to accomplish. So I think, um, you know, putting uh, yourself kind of second and putting the work first um, is is most key and most important to that. Um, and I, I agree with you on another point. I think everybody, well, a lot of people try to say everything is racist, you know, Um <laughs> If the lady in the grocery store calls on somebody next, you know, next to you. That's absolutely racist. (laughs) Absolutely racist. She has no idea when she turns around who was standing there first, but she happens to say something. No, she knows. (laughs) Are you being racist toward me because you didn't call me first? I mean, everything, you know, (laughs) you can't say that everything, you know. You know, (laughs) so uh, there was a situation yesterday. I was with someone yesterday and you know, uh, they called on somebody else first. And it was like, oh, well, I, I know I was here first. Well, yeah, it, it wasn't about that. People may have had appointments be- before you, so they could have went before you. So everything can't be racist. <laughs> <laughs> John, any thoughts about implicit bias? Sorry, what was that? Oh, did you already go? Yeah, it was my turn. Okay, Chevelle. <laughs> oh, no. So I do um, also agree with all of your points. Um, I think it is having a level of self-awareness and being able to identify what those implicit biases are. So really having that kind of deep self-awareness within yourself. Like, I know I have these implicit biases and then making sure that those don't spill over into the work that you're doing. But also, as John mentioned, having that network of people who are able to pick up on the things that even the most self-aware person wouldn't even be able to pick up on and being able to have somebody that can, like John mentioned, hold you accountable. So as we transition to get ready to close soon, before our closing statements, I want to talk a little bit about resilience and self-care. And so we know and recognize that the work for racial equity can be emotionally challenging and demanding. All of us, just in in a moment of transparency, as we got on the Zoom tonight, knowing this is our last Equity at Work webinar for 2023, the ABC team is exhausted, right? (laughs) Um, 
So we know that this work can not only be physically challenging, you know, in the course of just executing the work, but emotionally and mentally challenging to advocate for other people. It takes a toll. And so we want to encourage resilience and self-care practices to help sustain your energy and your motivation. What does that look like for each of you? Hmm. Wow. I would say being able to disconnect a little bit, like not being tied to the phone, not having to answer any emails or text messages, just being able to be present in the moment and maybe also getting, you know, just a little bit of sleep. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's hard work. And I think when you get the opportunity to have some downtime, you should take advantage of it. Um, you know, before your mind starts racing, you know, the next morning of what do you, what you have to do. Um, yeah, you just got to try to find a good work-life balance. Um, but there are times when you may have to check out um, just to really keep your sanity and to, to keep, keep it going because, you know, you will get fatigued in doing this work. Mm -hmm. John? I think one thing for me is... Um, Kind of like what Bernard was saying earlier, like finding your community. And I think, um, I think for me, part of it is like thinking about how, uh, how I am working to build. Like, this, this sounds like more work, but working to like build the, the communities that I want, like the community that I want to live in, and in what ways I can do that in ways that are not tied to like your paycheck. And I think, at least for me, I think when the good work that I want to be doing can't be entirely tied to my paycheck. And I think there are things that I need to be volunteering for and doing outside of that, um, that can, for one, like, you know, what I was saying before, like, when you feel that that impacts, like that gives you energy. So like, um, so like one thing I used to do, not so much anymore, is like every Sunday I would go uh, volunteer at Movable Fees. And one of the things is like, it's very like, you know, it's not strategic work. It's not necessarily like transformational work, but just like filling out food trays that I know are going out to people uh, living with, uh, with chronic illnesses. Like I know that it has like an immediate like impact on the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives me more energy, even though. Recharges. Yeah, yeah. In charges, yeah. That's amazing. So first of all, I want to thank each of you for being on the webinar tonight. And I'm going to give you the opportunity kind of in a round robin to give some closing thoughts about what it means to fight diversity fatigue and um, how important the work is for you, hopefully in a way that will encourage other people to be attached to racial equity work too. So we'll start with John Law. <laughs> uh, here, sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes, just with closing <laughs> remarks on why the work is important and some some words of encouragement you can leave to empower others um, to, you know, pick up the mantle and fight in, for racial equity. Yeah, I think uh, I think a big part of you know I I, I don't want to sound like uh, I'm just on repeat, uh, but I think a big part of like doing justice work, doing equity work, is being able to like envision what is that equitable world. So what is that equitable community, that equitable workplace mm -hmm. that you want to live in? And knowing like, how does that feel in your head, in your heart, in your body, in your belly? Um, and when you're able to like get that sense, get that feeling, I think that can guide like you to make sure like that the equity work that you're doing is moving you in the right direction. And that if it feels, you know, discomfort is part of it, is part of it, but there's a difference between something being uncomfortable and something feeling wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And I think when you are at the DEI training, when you're doing this work in your organization and it doesn't feel right, I think you should be listening to that. You should be listening to how it's not moving you toward uh, that, how you want to feel mm -hmm. uh, in an equitable world. That's great. Great advice. Bernard? You know, mine is, mine is a little bit more simple. I just say, keep fighting, keep pushing. Um, don't give up, you know, know the value of the work, you know, know your own worth. Um, you know, racism is not going to end in your lifetime. I mean, I hear you say that all the time, but I believe it. I know it's not going to end in my 
uh, lifetime. I know it will go on um, through my children and, and, and grandchildren at some point, but we can't stop this work. We have to continue. Um, and we have to be intentional about, you know, getting up and, and fighting uh, this behemoth every day. So I just tell people, you know, don't give up, you know, better days are ahead. Thank you. And Chevelle? Um, I just want to say that this work is transformative, it's important, and it's necessary. And I would encourage people doing this DEI work to always um, recognize those small victories. Um, with DEI strategies, the end result and the reward may not be to further down where you get that big reward, but those little small steps and little small journeys that occur in between that to make sure that you're taking advantage of that and recognizing the importance of those small steps and how eventually over time they'll lead to that bigger, you know, that bigger goal that's being set. Amen. And so thank you all for joining ABC's Equity at Work, not just tonight, but all year long. I'm going to give you a little recap of what we covered this year. We started the year by talking about confronting the angry Black woman stereotype. We talked about being woke at work. We talked about negotiating salary while Black, code switching, uh, addressing microaggressions, colorism, redefining professionalism, what it means to be twice as good, patriarchy and paternalism, navigating imposter syndrome, social exclusion, and then tonight fighting diversity fatigue. As we transition this webinar series into 2024, we are excited to invite those who want to share their lived experience and expertise to participate as panelists for ABC's Equity at Work. And we'll be back in January where our topic for the webinar will be navigating difficult conversations on race. And so for Associated Black Charities, this is John Law, Bernard Sims, Chevelle Montgomery, and I am Chrissy Thornton. Have a great evening and a happy holiday.